Whew, hello, good, well, good morning, good afternoon, how's everyone doing? This is Chris, I am uh, recording this on a very different setup than I would usually do, um, because the one thing that I really don't need right now is my main production workhorse dying. And that happened last night during a live stream. So yeah, I've, I've like a couple of years ago, I bought an iMac Pro, a used one, but in really good condition, uh, came with eight nice Intel cores, good machine, it was zippy, it was doing everything. I had plenty of ports to attach external stuff, microphone and the, the camera and whatever. And we were about to record our weekly happy shooting live stream like a podcast recording thing for the German Happy Shooting Podcast. We do this almost every week and we record on Tuesdays and then post it on Wednesdays, uh, on Thursdays. And uh, it all went pear-shaped. So the whole machine started behaving erratically and uh, plugging in the microphone, the, the process for, for the, the audio process for the microphone went to like 800% CPU use and things like that that were, well, we, we tried trouble, or I tried troubleshooting this with uh, like a whole bunch of people in the chat room waiting for the show and Boris, the, my partner on the show, uh, waiting. And that was not a nice evening. <laughs> anyway, uh, we canceled the live stream. I ran like a lot of diagnostics and things. And uh, turns out the thing is, well, the SSD is dead. The SSD in the system is, uh, beginning to throw errors and can't be repaired anymore by the onboard tools and that is not a good sign that is really not a good sign if you have an ssd beginning to get bad sectors and things then make a backup and it'll die it'll it will die i've seen this happen in the past so uh, where where a, a spinning disk will have uh, like will have like a bunch of spare sectors and it swaps them in when things start dying. You have a bit more time with the spinning disk, in my experience, than with an SSD when that starts happening. Anyway, so yeah, that SSD is not in a good shape, and the whole machine is not in good shape right now. So um, I'm recording this <laughs> on a different system in a different room, different microphone. Uh, Anyway, um, so I do have a few options here, and one would be to like to give it a bit of a life extension. Um, take some gaffer tape and like stick an external SSD to the back. And uh, I've done that in the past with um, like helping my mom and someone else with their computers when internal things died, and uh, an iMac isn't that easy to open up and repair so uh, sticking something to the back an external one it works it's a crutch though it doesn't have the speed doesn't have the durability so that did not um so i, I don't want to do that i just for this again this is my main machine it's not just a podcast recording machine it does video streaming it does uh, i do uh, actual work on that as in video production that kind of stuff so yeah uh second one is uh, this might be a good time to pull the plug and say, okay, this this is the last Intel machine in the house. Let's pull the plug. Let's go M, M2. New M2 MacBook Air. Actually, we'll leave this iMac Pro in the dust. Performance-wise. it zippy. Very zippy. Very fast. Uh, but, of course, it's a laptop. Which I'm not, I'm not worried about. Again, these M2 MacBook Airs fanless, silent, fast like hell, um, especially with the stuff that I do. I I wouldn't probably get it into that saturation where it starts throttling down. So um, I have a hard time managing that with my M1 MacBook that I'm recording this on right now. But the port situation is a bit difficult and the display situation is a bit difficult because I'm spoiled. iMac, 27-inch, 5K display, Gorgeous display. Um, the MacBook Air M2, 13 inches. Bit smaller. 
yeah, a little bit smaller. And the port situation. So uh, I, I would need a hub, something external. Um, if you have, okay, this is this is for you. If you have first-hand experience of hooking up, like this is a Thunderbolt USB 4 kind of situation here with the MacBooks. Um, so what I'd need is a hub that gives me like a bunch of USB. Uh, would be nice to have an HDMI out and an Ethernet port. But I'm looking for first-hand experience. I have o I've already done all the Googling that is necessary. So if you don't have a first-hand experience <laughs> with a hub like that, then yeah, don't uh, don't Google it for me because I've already done that. I, I appreciate you wanting to help, but that is that is that that's using up more of my time than the first-hand experience. Um, and the display situation, yeah, there is the Apple Studio display. It's very nice. I like the looks. I've seen it, actually, and I've used it. Uh, it's I, I have access to one. But the price hurts a bit. So, yeah. Hmm. At this, right now, pandemic and stuff, I'm trying to keep my finances together as much as I can. Especially as I'm not doing any <laughs> any travel at this point, so um, yeah, so yeah, the, the the display hurts a bit. Uh, it it still work as a temporary thing for a while, and but yeah, I'm I'm not happy about the external display situations for these kind of machines right now. Um, and other option would be like a refurbished M2 MacBook Pro, but. That would have the same issues, like the ports and the display. It's also bigger. I kind of like the small nature of the of the Air form factor, and it's also not really necessary because the M2 Air is silent, doesn't have a fan, and still faster than the iMac Pro. So yeah, I wouldn't be worried about that at all. So again, and last option, of course, is repair. But to be honest. This Intel machine really does feel a bit alien in in a in a in, in our Apple environment here, especially since the like again I'm sitting in front of the M uh, the M1 MacBook Air that I bought a couple of years ago that was originally meant to be a travel machine. Haha, <laughs> travel. Remember that. Um, and uh, that, that M1 feels zippy, very zippy compared to the big Intel machine. So it's quite amazing. So I, um, anyway, I guess I will go for the M2 MacBook Air. Like I, I'll, I'll have to spec it up to 16 or 24 gigs of RAM and a two terabyte SSD. Uh, and then that will probably be my main production machine without an external screen for now. So yeah... That, yeah, let me know if you have any good ideas. <laughs> let me know if if you have any feedback uh, regarding that. Um, tfttf.com slash hi is the place to leave your feedback. tfttf.com slash hi. And uh, by the way, if you'd, if you'd like to support me um, in this unexpected uh, loss of a of an important machine time, um, tfttf.com slash support. There's plenty of ways to to send a little bit of financial support my way. Anyway, that's kind of the, 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 the state right now, the state of things right now. Um, let's get into the show. Let's get into photography. Um, let me see. Ha, ah, next, next thing is well, sort of about photography, um, but it's also about a week of vacation. Monica and I went uh, to do a week of vacation in Pelvorm. Pelworm, P-E-L-L-W-O-R-M. It's an island um, in the North Sea with, yeah, what does it have? Not much. <laughs> Sheep, wind, a few stores, houses, a lighthouse, um, dikes. And we rented a vacation home for a week there. And the saying goes, Pelworm, you either come once and never return because there's nothing there, or you come once and then return again and again because there's because there's nothing there. And this was, <clears throat> excuse me, this was our third time on the island. We uh, we visited once for a day, 
um, a while ago, and then we went there in spring, rented a place for a week, and now we we're back in um, in October, and we'll probably be back there next spring because we kind of fell in love with this place. It's it's like thirty seven square kilometers, so it's not really huge. It's like like by car, you can cross it in five minutes, roughly, maybe ten maximum. Um, <clears throat> and it's 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 in the middle of the Wadden Sea, Wattenmeer, Wadden, W A D D E N C, which is like a big flat um, part of the North Sea. It's a world, I think, it's a World Heritage site, and uh, the tides will explore the sea floor. Like this is an area of like I don't know three four thousand square kilometers or square miles, so it's sizable. And people will will hike in that uh, in that on that flat. They will. There's a, it's a unique ecosystem, and the, yeah, the water's gone half of the time. Um, half half of the time, you will look at mud. <laughs> and uh, also, Pelworm is like two to six feet under the sea level, which makes it again special. Um, so there's a dike around the entire island to keep it dry, and it's. So, so you, you don't really see the sea anyway because you are under the sea and there's an 8 meter, uh, 24, 25 foot dike around the island that is usually um, kept in shape by a lot of sheep on it that help compact it by, by, by living on it pretty much and keeping the seagrass at bay. And so if you want to see the sea, you go and go on top of the dike and... Uh, it's wonderful. It's it's just amazingly nice there. Sheep, wind, the water and sea, and not much else. Um, I've I've uh, put some photos on a on a little gallery. It's linked uh, in the show notes, so you can have a look there. Um, also, there's an interesting energy project there, like the the island. According to Wikipedia, the island hosts one of the largest hybrid renewable energy plants in Europe which combines like 2.7 megawatt solar panels and 5.7 megawatt of wind energy and half a megawatt of biogas energy. So uh, their their average electricity production is like, uh, exceeds their demand multiple times. So um, because of that, they also, uh, in 2015, again, I'm reading from Wikipedia here, they... Uh, the, the EU built the lar largest stationary energy storage facility there, um, which is like a big lithium iron battery, iron, iron, <laughs> lithium iron battery, and a, a vanadium flow battery and like a thermal storage unit and so on. I'm not sure how, how, how it will compete to the current installations in Australia and so on, but it's, again, for 2015, it was huge. Anyway, so yeah, it's a. It's a cool place, and driving there with an electric car, a hey, this just per feels perfect, feels absolutely perfect. Um, very clean air, everything is nice there. So, uh, from a photography point of view, um, yeah, I didn't really do that much. I mean, I brought the 7D Mark II, which is a DSLR. I put the 24 millimeter pancake lens on it. That felt like the right choice i didn't want to haul an entire photo backpack and it was it wasn't a photo vacation it was a vacation vacation just to to get grounded again to have to have the wind blow uh, blow through my brain and clear it out and that kind of stuff so um it was i had this one dslr 24 millimeter pancake lens and never touched it <laughs> i was i was on the table uh, in our vacation place, it was on the table. It just sat there and didn't matter because, of course, I have the iPhone, and that was enough for for just capturing like stuff, interesting stuff, fun stuff, um, little vignettes. I call them vignettes. Little tiny um, pictures of I don't know a sign or the the ferry port or uh, a couple of rapids uh, or some sheep in front of the lighthouse we met we had a nice story where we met a cat 
Or a cat met us and adopted us, a little cat, and followed us around for like six kilometers. And these kind of things were like, yeah, feels feels like feels like fe felt right. And I think it's perfectly okay to every now and then go, ah, you know, just forget about it. Just enjoy. And that's what we did. So that was fun. Uh, speaking of fun, hey, it is spooky October. And I just came across a website. Um, well, it's, it's someone t uh, selling a book about about ur urban exploration, lost places kind of stuff. Um, but what they also did is in, in German, but you can watch, you can look at the pictures on there. What they also did is they um, they used I'm not even sure which one of the systems. It was one of the image generators, one of one of the AI image generators. Could have been stable diffusion. Um, let me check on the website. Or was it Dali? Anyway, they don't even specify. It's, it looks looks like looks like Mid Journey. Anyway, um, and uh, and uh, created like a, a virtual story called, called Horror Hospital, which is like a very old derelict hospital. Scenes from an old derelict hospital. The the entryway with a big staircase and rooms with weird instruments in them and. And water and debris on the floor and windows smashed in and, um, well, what you would expect from a really old house. Um, all artificially generated, but hey, it's visual, visual, beautiful visuals. Um, that's the kind of stuff that I would probably look for when trying to do some real dark urban exploration kind of stuff. Anyway, I thought it would be a good fit here for October for you to um, yeah <laughs> to do some exploration on your own and you know what in that case I don't really care about if this art comes from a computer or from a camera I mean it would be different if it came from a camera because you knew someone was <clears throat> was climbing around in there and um, but first of all I don't think a place like this really exists <laughs> And uh, second of all, um, it the pictures make me feel something. And that doesn't really, for me, it doesn't really matter how those pictures have come into existence. But they, yeah, they do make me feel something. And that works, that works well for me. All right, last, last but not least, um, a question that came up, I don't even know, a few weeks ago on, on the Happy Shooting podcast that I thought, I could bring over here is a question about how how does how does my camera age? Do cameras age? I mean, someone I think wanted to buy a used camera, and they just had the question: What about the the camera's age? What 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 goes wrong? What happens with the camera over time? And and there's a plenty of uh, ways cameras can age. If you have an old camera, you know that. Um, of course, mechanical. I mean, shutters, it, many cameras still have shutters. Uh, they are mechanical. There's a spring, there's electromechanics, there's curtain, there's uh, capacitors, there's electronics in there that can age. Capacitors do age. Um, but, you know, my Minolta X700 from like the 80s, uh, it's still going strong 40 years later. So that's totally fine. Um, <clears throat> for digital cameras, the sensor can age with film cameras yeah you know each picture is a new sensor so that doesn't really matter but um yeah um digital cameras the sensor can age and i think that's that's one of the main areas unless we want to talk about plastics and things because i i've had a few earlier plastics cameras and they will age um, some of those <clears throat> so those rubber those rubbery bits on a camera i've had a few old cameras where the rubbery bits were like really sticky and that's just because they didn't have much long-term experience with these uh, materials back then so um that's something that you can usually take off clean up i've used what did i use um i think orange oil orange oil can take plastic well some plastics dissolve in orange oil yeah 
and that that uh, helped me to, to take the the uppermost layer off of that plastic, and then it wasn't sticky again, uh, sticky anymore. So that worked. But um, yeah, the the materials, but like like foams, for example, in in film cameras, you see foam uh, as a light seal on the back of the camera. And uh, again, when they started using those foams back in the I don't know, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, those foams, they didn't have long-term experience, and those foams will turn in, into a tar-like substance that gets gooey, sticky, and uh, can gum up the works in the camera. And uh, so, yeah, the the, the 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 foams. Check those out if you buy an old camera. But let's talk about sensors because that's that was what that question was mainly uh, targeted at and there are a few parts to the sensors there's a uh, the the pixel sites themselves the individual pixels which are electronic components that can die or we'll, we'll get to that um there's a filter layer on top which is uh well we, we typically call that the Bayer array which is our red green blue green kind of filter so the adjacent pixels have different colors or see different colors and color filters will age over time. Um, I've seen <laughs> I've seen that firsthand back in the eighties, like stage lighting, um, where you use those color gels on those hot hot pre LED halogen lights and the incandescent lights. Uh, the heat would kill those filters over time, and the filters would like de the colors colors would fade. Um, in some cases, if you have like a really hot light, a filter might fade within a few hours. Uh, it runs too hot. Uh, I don't think that's a problem for camera sensors or or the filters in front of camera sensors because th those are caps encapsulated. There's not that much heat. Uh, UV doesn't get there, or at least not a lot, because there's a UV filter, UV filter in front of it. Ozone, another color killer, um, shouldn't really get there because again, it's it's a, it's a package pretty much. So yeah, that doesn't seem like a big issue. And also the cameras, there's, there's something we call auto white balance. So even if the colors, the filters might change over time, the I think the cameras can compensate for that. I've never really seen an, an older digital camera to be really off in colors. Um, having said that, I mean, older cameras, many older cameras didn't have really good colors to to start with. So uh, most modern cameras have better color science. and But I don't think that's because of the older cameras being, the filters being broken. Anyway, that's one thing. Um, <clears throat> but then there is one way in which sensors will age, and that is because of particles, because of high energy particles cosmic rays cosmic particles um you get those mostly in elevated areas like on mountains or in airplanes those particles uh some of those will reach the earth like our ground level here but uh, most of them will be um will be converted to less energetic particles on the way down. So, um, yeah, those cosmic particles can hit the electronics in your camera, on on your sensor. And that might be or might turn into a problem. Now, it's not a real problem, and we'll get to that in a minute, but um, there's two kinds of things that can happen. There might be more, but those are the two most prominent ones that I know about. And one is uh, so-called dead pixels. So if uh, if one of these particles hits the right spot in in a pixel's electronics on the sensor, um, a dead pixel means that this, the pixel is dead. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't see light anymore. It produces a black pixel in your photo. And then there's hot pixels, which is the opposite. It's a single pixel being on all the time, being on permanently. So you would have a, a red, a green, or a blue pixel uh, being turned on um, with green pixels having a higher likelihood, a higher uh, statistical likelihood because there's more of them on the sensor. And these hot pixels are potentially uh, an issue. Now, 
Those hot pixels should be easy to spot because they are bright. The dark, the dead pixels are hard to spot. Black pixel in between things doesn't really show, especially when we're talking like 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 million pixels on the sensor. One single dead pixel is probably uh, not going to stick out, whereas a hot pixel might. And uh, the good thing is, this is easy to detect for a camera for the software in the camera or in your computer so if you shoot a jpeg the camera will just take care of that automatically it will like it'll look at neighboring pixels and if there's like a pixel all the way on or uh, without the neighboring pixels being all the way on that's just how i would imagine that that algorithm to work um i think there should be the software should be able to spot those like 100 percent, and then just uh Replace them with a neighboring pixel or uh, replace the value with averaging uh, pixels around the hot pixel. So uh, that's what's happening in your camera. If you shoot JPEG, the camera will take them out. And if you shoot RAW, those hot pixels and those dead pixels will be in the RAW. But your software will take care of that too. Like your Lightroom or your... On one or whatever you use will take care of those hot pixels too. And it will do that pretty reliably. Um, my, oh my God, which one was that? The 5D Mark II, which I used for like nine years uh, while traveling a lot. That had hundreds of hot pixels. And after <laughs> after importing into Lightroom, I've never saw a hot pixel. So I would think, and to to just bring this uh, to the bring this to the to the conclusion, don't worry about aging digital cameras. Um, not really. I don't think that's an issue. And that's where the outro music would play. But again, this is an emergency setup, so I'll have to I'll have to. Uh, to wave goodbye to you without music. But before we do that, there's one piece of feedback that came in. Again, you can leave feedback at tfttf.com slash hi. That's tfttf.com slash hi. I love hearing from you. You can also upload a voicemail there or just write something. Um, happy about hearing from you. Dan did just that. And he writes just a very quick note. I've been listening to you since the beginning. I listened to your podcast about developing the top floor. Oh yeah, I remember that. I did. I did a, a special, like a, a separate podcast on uh, <clears throat> on starting my business and getting things off the ground. That was a very good, helpful uh, vehicle to do that. Anyway, uh, Dan continues. I was so pleased to hear you back on the weekly TFTTF podcast. I've listened to you on the Tech Guy podcast on the future of photography and the one with the Canadian guys. I'm so glad you were able to get through the pandemic. Thank you for all you do. I really enjoy hearing your cheerful voice. Take care, Dan. Dan, thank you so much for the nice feedback. Yep, I'm glad to be back. Um, I'm not too sure that we are through the pandemic because um, just over the last week, the numbers in Germany have skyrocketed so um yeah anyway with that have a great time thanks for listening go out and take amazing photos be really really extra nice to each other that is very important in these times be nice to each other give others the benefit of the doubt and of course happy shooting <laughs>